Hello, you're listening to Conversing the Classics. Today we're discussing the first century BC Latin poet known for both the wit and romantic nature of his work. His themes are so universal, amusing and engaging that his work has been read and enjoyed for over 2,000 years. Joining me today to discuss the life and poetry of Catullus is Monica Gale, Associate Professor of Latin at Trinity College Dublin. Now, Professor Gale is currently writing a commentary on the poetry of Catullus. Professor Gale, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for asking me. So... He's an ancient author, and the problem with ancient authors is usually their works survive in fragments. And some authors, you will have two poems, some you will have the whole lot. How much of Catullus's work survives? That's actually a more complicated question than you might think, Mm. in the sense that if you look at a modern edition of Catullus, the poems are numbered from 1 to 116. Mm. But in fact, there are not 116 Mm. poems. There's a, a gap modern editions jump straight from 17 to 20 and the reason Mm. for that is that three poems were inserted by renaissance scholars which we now agree um, almost everyone agrees are not in fact by catullus so those are coming out again how do we know that they're not by catullus what's the telltale sign it's the style in effect yeah they they don't read uh, as catullus poems and then there are a number of other poems which the manuscripts give as one poem where Mm. modern scholars think in fact we've got more than one poem mm. sort of jammed together but it's somewhere around 116 would be the the total that we have now we know almost certainly that Catullus wrote other poems which mm. have not survived in that uh, one or two lines are quoted mm. by other ancient authors which don't come anywhere mm. in the manuscripts we have mm. but we've no real way of knowing whether this is you know more or less the complete body of what he wrote yeah. or whether in fact there's lots more that has mm. just just been lost so what do we know about him as a character the example I always give is Herodotus. We have his work, it's brilliant, but we know nothing about him. Mm. How much do we know about the author of the poetry, Catullus? A little bit like Herodotus. There's very little that we know for sure. And we do know that he came from the town of Verona, which in his day was not part of, of Italy proper. It was part of the province mm. of what was known as Gaul on this side mm. of the Alps. So he's a provincial. And that's quite important, arguably, for some of his poems, mm. where we get you know a little bit of a sense that he was an outsider. Mm. We don't know his exact date of birth. Our sources are contradictory on this, yeah. but probably around about 87 BC, maybe 84 BC. So he's, um, he's very, very late Republic. Then, That's sort right, of yeah. yeah. The so the last time. generation of the Republic, yeah. really. We know that he at some point came to Rome. Most of his poems uh, appear to be set in Rome. He mentions uh, a number of, of locations mm. in Rome, the Forum, for example. Yeah. And in one poem, he actually refers, when he's back in Verona, he refers to Rome as his home. Yeah. So he clearly felt very much at so, home there. So do we know actually how he ends up coming to Rome from Verona? What brings them to Rome? Not for sure, but I think we can make a pretty good guess in Mm. that this tends to happen with ancient writers generally. Mm. I always think of it as a little bit like the way that actors in the modern world tend to gravitate to Hollywood. Mm. You know, if you want to make it as an actor, that's where you have to go, as a film actor particularly. Mm. So I think much the same was true for anyone who really wanted to make it as a writer Mm. in Republican Rome and Imperial Rome. Mm. The city of Rome was where you you needed to go. And in terms of, you said there, we know very little about his life. What sources do you use to approach to find out about his life? Well, the main source inevitably is his own writings. And traditionally, scholars had a tendency to take them very much at face value. Mm. So there was almost a kind of industry in the 19th and earlier 20th century in writing Mm. biographies of Catullus. More recently, I think we've begun to become a bit more suspicious. I mean, Mm. writers generally, and perhaps poets above all, have this tendency to sort of create their own Mm. persona, their own personality. And I think that's particularly true of Catullus. Um, One key bit of evidence, though, is a very brief mention in Suetonius's biography of Julius Caesar, where he just happens to mention in passing that Catullus's father was on good terms with Julius Caesar. And that would tend to suggest that although he was a provincial, he came from a pretty aristocratic background. Right. So we shouldn't think of him as a, a mm. sort of, um, you know, country bumpkin yeah. going to Rome. OK, and now moving, I think, mainly, we want to talk about his poetry here, because that's what he's best known for. When you read his poems, they're, they're brilliant poems. A lot of them are very, very short. And mm. we were saying there earlier, the Latin is quite easy, so they're quite accessible. But... A reoccurring figure who I think appears in about 90 of his poems, you could probably give me the exact figure, is a character called Lesbia. Who is she? Lesbia, yes, a fascinating figure. In fact, she, that she's only mentioned by name in about a dozen of the poems. Oh, okay. But Catullus does quite frequently refer to a woman, my, my girl, my, my mm. woman, without naming her. And... I think it's natural to assume that those references are to Lesbia, Mm. particularly as he tends to echo phrases or Mm. echo little ways that he describes her from one poem Mm. to another. It's very characteristic of Catullus's collection that we get these 
sort of interconnections mm. between poems. So she's, she's quite certainly quite a prominent figure in the collection. Mm. She appears to be an aristocratic lady. We know that she's married. Mm. Charles mentions that in, in one poem. She's not his wife, that he has to steal his knights with her from mm. her, her legitimate husband. And he seems to have had a very passionate affair with her, yeah. a very turbulent affair with her. He describes quarrels between them. He describes his sort of increasing suspicion mm. that, that he's not her only lover. Yeah. He describes what appears to be the final breakup between them. Who then was she? Well, this is a question which has fascinated scholars. Mm. And some, if you read some works on Catullus, they will tell you that she was a woman whose real name was Mm. Claudia Matelli. Now, in fact, our evidence for that is not as conclusive as some would have Mm. you believe. We know a certain amount about Claudia, mostly from Cicero, Mm. who portrays Claudia as a very, what's the word, pleasure-loving mm. woman. She has lots of lovers, according to mm. Cicero. She's a widow by that date and conducts herself, according to Cicero, almost like a prostitute. Yeah. I mean, she, she, she takes lovers freely, mm. which seems to make her rather like the way that Catullus describes Lesbia when he's in his more bitter mood. Yeah. But, of course, that coincidence doesn't really prove mm. anything. I think both what Cicero says and what Catullus yeah. says could be regarded very much as a kind of negative stereotype yeah. of a particular kind of woman. So, but we have no sort of indication as to definitely who she was or much about her life. We just know that Catullus was in love with this woman and he coins her the name Lesbia. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the key bit of evidence, I suppose, well, there are two key bits of evidence, aside mm. from the similarity with, with Cicero's Clodia. Mm. One is that uh, a writer called Apuleius, who was writing, it should be said, some 200 years later, yeah. says that her real name was Clodia. Mm. And the temptation then is to identify with the Clodia that we yeah. knew most yeah. about, that we know most about. The second piece of evidence is, in fact, internal again. So in Perm 79, yeah. Catullus writes that somebody called Lesbius, it, Lesbius S. Pulcare, in Latin, yeah. Lesbius is sort of a pretty boy, yeah. and the Claudia that Cicero writes about had a brother whose name was Claudius Pulcare. Yeah. So it seems that there may be a kind of play on words mm. in that poem that he's saying that Lesbius is a pretty boy, but Lesbius's name yeah. is also Pulcare, yeah. which again would support the identification with with the famous yeah. Claudia. The problem there being that Claudia had two sisters who were mm. also called Claudia yeah. because of the way that Roman mm. female names were worked, and it could have been any of them. Yeah. For all we know, even even if we accept that she was a Claudia. And I should have identified this earlier on, but we're just going to throw it in before we move on to the next question. Why she's called? Why is she called Lesbia? Why is she called Lesbia? The the, the kind of key poem here is poem 51, Mm. which is a translation of a poem by Sappho, the archaic Greek Mm. poetess Sappho, who came from the island of Lesbos. Mm. So Lesbia, the woman of Lesbos, Mm. could be a way of referring to Sappho. Mm. In that poem, then, he also gives his girlfriend or his his beloved the Mm. name Lesbia. And so fairly clearly, given Mm. that it's a translation, one thing that's going on is a kind of tribute to Sappho. So Mm. Sappho is a poet who writes passionately about her feelings for other women in her circle, Mm. Catullus then is sort of taking over her poetic voice Mm. in one sense. And as a part of that, then he, as a sort of compliment, I suppose, to Lesbia, Mm. he gives her the name of the poetess that he's paying homage to. Mm. Now, Lesbia, she appears all over his poetry. She's sort of the reoccurring figure. But are there any other major reoccurring figures in his poems? There are several figures who come up at least more than once. I suppose the ones that particularly spring to mind are two sort of contrasting pairs. So he has a pair of very good friends whose mm. names are Varanius and Fabullus, and they occur both as a pair and separately in a number of poems. And Catullus is very affectionate. He talks about wanting to shower Varanius mm. with kisses, for example, when he's come mm. back from, from holiday. But particularly he compliments them on their their wittiness, their stylishness, their mm. smartness. And then in contrast to Varanius and Fabullus, we have another pair of men that Catullus is very hostile to. Uh, Furius and Aurelius are Mm. their names and there are a number of poems in which they're attacked, particularly as rivals. So there seems to be a kind of erotic rivalry going on with these two characters. um, There's a particular poem, I'm not going to give the translation of it because it's probably a bit rude, but it was one of the first ones that I, Pedicabo ego vos et iromabo. (laughs) You can look that up if you want to actually see what it means. Some Uh, some of Catullus's most scurrilous attacks are are, are, are aimed at these two. What are the key themes then? So he talks about all these figures but what are the key themes of Catullus as poetry. Well, one of the, the, the most central themes, and we've talked about love as a key mm. theme, but one of the most central themes is actually almost embodied in that pair, Varenius and Fabullus, in two senses. I mean, first of all, friendship is a really central theme. Mm. And indeed, friendship and love 
are almost two sides of the same coin for Catullus. So when he talks about his love for Lesbia, mm-hmm. very interestingly in 1 poem 109, he describes it as a bond of friendship, a foedus amicitiae, which is a really interesting way in the context of first century yeah. Rome to talk about a relationship with a woman, mm-hmm. in the sense that amicitia is a term you'd normally apply to mm-hmm. friendship between men, mm-hmm which would traditionally be taken much more seriously. Mm. Love affairs tend to be regarded as something rather rather trivial, rather trifling, unimportant, very different way of thinking about love from the way yeah. we would tend to think about it. So he's, he strikes me as a very, very passionate man, mm. very mm. sort of stereotypically poet. Now, in terms of, he's obviously a poet, but what's different about him is, is that as opposed to writing these long epics like all the poets before him had, Homer obviously being the most famous, he writes very little short mm-hmm. sort of, you know, five to ten line poems. Yeah. What kind of meters does he use? The classic dactylic hexameter or does he make use of new meters? Well, in fact, he uses a very wide range of meters, most of which, well, all of which are taken over from, from Greek poetry. Mm. And in fact, the collection is divided. There's some discussion about whether this goes back to mm. Catullus's own day or not. But by modern scholars, the, the collection is traditionally divided into three sections, mm. the first of which is known as the polymetrics because mm. it's written in a range of different meters. Mm. Of which the, the one he uses most is a metre called the Hendeka syllable. Mm. So uh, for any listeners who have Greek, you'd be able to work out that means an 11 <laughs> syllable line, mm. um, which is a rather sort of conversational metre. So yeah. it's useful for poems where he's sort of relating little anecdotes, as he mm. does in a number of cases. Then the last part of the collection, the last third of the collection, is written entirely in the elegiac metre, mm. which was traditionally used for epigrams. So these are, these are sort of short, pithy poems, not mm. always witty as we might think of an epigram as being Mm. but ones that try to um, boil an idea down to its sort of very Mm. um, briefest Mm. most concise form then the central part of the collection consists of longer poems which again are in different meters but Mm. the the longest of all does use the that hexameter Mm. the meter which is most familiar i suppose to to most of us from virgil's Aeneid. now we've said he's a very typical poet with his themes what are his, the major influences on his writing? That's an interesting question too. And I think, again, we can divide the main earlier writings which have influenced Catullus into three groups. Mm. So uh, we already mentioned Sappho. Sappho and archaic Greek poetry is quite important for Catullus, particularly, I suppose, in the, the first part of the collection. Mm. He draws on Sappho for her sort of passionate expression of emotion. He also draws on invective poetry, so that is attack poetry, insult mm. poetry, of which we have a certain amount surviving from, mm. from archaic Greece. Then the second group would be Hellenistic poetry. Hellenistic poetry, Hellenistic poets wrote, well, they really brought the writing of epigram mm. to a fine art, and Catullus mm. is, is quite heavily influenced by a number of, mm. of Hellenistic epigrammatists. But a really key figure here is Callimachus. Now, Callimachus is perhaps not such a familiar name as he he maybe should be, but he was a very influential figure on Roman poetry, particularly because he advocated a real concern with careful writing, with a very refined style of writing. Mm -hmm. And that's something that Catullus really espouses in a number of Mm -hmm. his poems. He talks about the importance of a sort of really careful, minute artistry. Mm. And you can see that, I think, very clearly reflected Mm. in his poems. And then the third type of of writing, which is very important for Catullus, and I think this is perhaps not often recognised often Mm. enough as it should be, is Roman comedy, perhaps, rather surprisingly. So Roman comedy typically revolves around a young man in love. He's often in love with a prostitute Mm. or a woman who's sort of unsuitable one way or another. We have blocking characters of various sorts. So his father typically Mm -hmm. tries to get him away from the prostitute's clutch. Mm. Now, in a number of ways, we can see Catullus as almost taking on that role of the comic Mm. young man onto himself. And that's very interesting, I think, if we're thinking about how we react to these poems. I mean, it's perhaps natural for us to feel sympathetic towards Mm. Catullus. Uh, You know, here's this young man in love. He doesn't have have a very... uh, I mean, his love is not wholly reciprocated by Lesbia. But I think to an ancient reader there would be, have been perhaps more of a tendency to regard him yeah. as a kind of mildly comic figure because of this comic mm-hmm. background that he's writing yeah. against. So he's, he's, um, he is writing in the first century BC, and I think that, that that's quite important. To contextualise things for the listeners, could you tell us a bit about how poetry got around Rome and maybe how his poems were received by his contemporaries. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, again, this has been a question which has been quite extensively discussed by scholars, but it seems likely, and I think this is becoming a consensus nowadays, it seems quite likely that his poetry was circulated in different ways. Mm -hmm. So we shouldn't think, I mean, in the modern world, 
poetry or prose writing typically gets published. It's there in bookshops for you to buy. That's probably not very much like the way things mm. worked in first century Rome. So we should think of these poems perhaps as being circulated informally to begin mm. with, maybe sent to the people they're addressed to. Each poem mm. usually has a, a named addressee. So maybe the love poems might have been sent to Lesbia herself. Yeah. They might have been read to friends, for example, at parties. Yeah. They might have been circulated in smaller collections. We don't know who put together the collection as we had it. So this may not have been compiled as a a large-scale collection, perhaps until after Catullus' death. And that raises the question, you know, he's just sort of writing these poems, sending them around. How did Catullus make his money? How did he live? He he almost certainly didn't need to make money. Mm. It's slightly misleading here that he himself says, for example, in poem 13, which is a very funny poem, it's a dinner invitation where he tells the guest, come to dinner, but you need to bring everything (laughs) with you. You bring the wine, you bring the food, you bring the girl. Yeah, it's a Um, a very, very good one. And he says, uh, the reason for this is that I have no money. My my Mm. purse is full of cobwebs, is the way he very picturesquely puts it. But I think this is more to do with his status as a relatively young man who would have been dependent for a kind of allowance Mm. on his father, so long as his father was mm. still alive. The, uh, such evidence as we have suggests that he came, as I say, from quite an aristocratic background, quite a wealthy background. So probably he had, as we would say, independent means. Mm. But I mean, we, we shouldn't think of ancient writers in general as making money from their works. Mm. Making money directly from writing was almost impossible in the sense that there was, there was no publishing Virgil, industry. Virgil, of course, being the exception to that. Well, Virgil made his money from patronage. I mean, that, that yeah. was the one way that you could do it, that if you were, as it were, adopted by a great mm. public figure who would take you under his wing, that figure might give you presents, as so, it were. Do you think this is something that I'm just sort of going to throw out there, but do you think it's possible then that the perhaps... Catullus met th- Lesbia through her husband, who was in some way putting him up or sponsoring him, or it's certainly possible, and that has mm. been that has been conjectured. There's one poem in which uh, Catullus talks about Lesbia sort of bad mouthing him to mm. her husband, which I mean is easy to imagine in that kind of context. If mm. we imagine a sort of dinner party setting where Catullus is sitting there and watching mm. the two of them uh, talking to each <laughs> other, I mean we should think of this very much as a, a face-to-face aristocratic society. Mm. So it, it's very likely that Catullus mm. would have had contact with with Lesbia's husband, and that could could well be how they met. Mm. Now, the first century BC that Catullus is writing in, it's very patriarchal and this whole idea of the masculine general. Does Catullus conform in his poetry to the standard Roman view on masculinity and then I suppose mm. to furthermore sexuality. Mm-hmm. And this to me is one of the most fascinating things about Catullus's poetry that again like all the best questions that's one that doesn't admit of a, a straightforward mm. answer I think in the sense that particularly in his relationship with Lesbia but also in some of the other poems we find him very often adopting a very sort of untraditional almost feminized mm. um, self depiction. Mm. So he talks about his relationship with Lesbia for example as I said in terms of amicitia, friendship which would tend to put them on a par. Elsewhere, he talks about her very much as the one who's in charge of the relationship. And this is sometimes something he seems to welcome. Mm. But at other times, in poem 11, for example, which is a poem where he's sort of Try saying his represents himself as saying his final mm. farewell to her. He talks that he represents her as almost a kind of monster of, of insatiable sexual desire. Mm. So there, he's very much in the the disempowered, the feminized position. She's the one who's in control. He describes his love as a flower at the mm. edge of a meadow, which has been cut down by a plow. The plow being a, a traditional symbol of masculine mm. sexuality, whereas he's the the sort of uh, frail flower, <laughs> the victim of this masculine woman. Um, and it's very interesting to me that we find these two stances, the desire for a kind of gender equality perhaps Mm. alongside almost a resentment of the way that the lesbians have feminised him. Other poems again then, poems particularly written this time to men, represent him taking on a much more macho stance. Yes. Um, so the one you cited, the, the, yeah. the, the, the one where he's attacking the <laughs> Aurelius, he says that he's going to humiliate them sexually. Yeah. He represents himself as adopting a very sort of sexually aggressive yeah. stance towards them. Um, and these two sides of Catullus' self-depiction, very much in tension with each other, I think are what give the poetry a lot of its energy, a lot of its fascination yeah. for the, the modern reader. And in terms of just going back to the picking up on the point about his effeminate nature in some of his poems do we know how how that was received by ancient sort of not necessarily his contemporaries but just by ancient authors reading him in general because it it did quite differ from the norm yeah yeah 
funnily enough, they don't seem to have found it as shocking as we might expect. So, for example, Pliny, the, the letter writer Pliny, mm. who is nothing if not an eminently respectable person, as yeah. he insists on telling us, seems to have been very fond of Catullus. Mm. Maybe this was because they tended to separate literary image from reality, though mm. often the way that ancient writers talk about poets suggests that the two were conflated, that, mm. you know, that ancient readers often took yeah. quite straightforwardly what a poet said about himself as being the, yeah. the literal truth. Mm. So you know, perhaps surprisingly, they weren't as, as upset by this as we yeah. might have expected them to be. Okay. It is certainly yeah. quite pro- provocative. Mm. Now, the majority of his poems you mentioned earlier are short, sort of five to ten line verses. But one of his poems, I, I can't remember what number, is a short epic. Can you tell me a little bit more about it? Yeah, this is poem 64. It's a wonderful poem. It's about the, the marriage of Peleus and Thetis, the parents mm. of Achilles. Structurally, it's very, very interesting in that we have a sort of frame. So the story of Peleus and Thetis is a sort of frame narrative. But set within that, we have two very long digressions, one of which is a long description of the bedspread of all things on the marriage bed, which depicts the story of Theseus and Ariadne. Mm. So another mythical couple. Mm. And then in the second part of the poem, we have the prophecy of the fates. The fates come to the wedding mm. and they tell Peleus and Thetis that they're going to have this wonderful son, yeah. heroic son, Achilles. Mm. Now, that all sounds a little bit dry, but in fact, they're really interesting sort of ironic undercurrents created by these two insets, that the wedding is superficially represented as very happy. You know, Peleus and Thetis are the, the ecstatic couple. Mm. They love each other dearly. But they're contrasted then quite strikingly with Theseus and Ariadne mm. on the bedspread and um, Ariadne was abandoned cruelly mm. abandoned by Theseus on the island of, of Naxos yeah. and then in the second part of the poem the fates sort of overtly are saying what, the, what a wonderful son they're going mm. to have but the way that they talk about Achilles is actually very disturbing in some ways they really emphasise the bloodthirsty mm. side of his character so that you know what on the face of it is a very optimistic mm. prophecy of this the son who is going to be born mm. if we scratch a little bit below the surface comes to seem rather troubling yeah uh, certainly ironic and do we know why he decided to sort of differ from his normative thing of writing short poems and suddenly write this this Mm. epic there seems to have been something of a fashion amongst uh, other poets of the period. Catullus, I, I talked about his friends earlier, a number of his, uh, his friends mentioned in the collection were fellow poets, and mm. he seems to have belonged to a sort of, we perhaps shouldn't describe it quite as a movement, but a loose mm. grouping of poets who wrote in similar style. Now, yeah. most of the others have survived only in very fragmentary form, very little snippets. Yeah. But we know, for example, that Calvus wrote a poem similar to mm. this one called the Io, uh, and we know of a number of others apparently in the same sort of mm. style and on the same scale. And again, this all goes back to Callimachus. He wrote mm. a poem called The Hecale, yeah. which was in this kind of genre, so a short epic poem, dealing with, you know, by contrast with traditional epic, dealing with rather unheroic themes. Mm. And this seems to have been something of a sort of, almost a badge of achievement mm. for poets of this period. If you mm. wanted to write your masterpiece and you were a poet who favoured this kind of style, also mostly these very short poems, mm. you wanted to write your masterpiece, then you wrote an epic, but it was this kind of characteristically unepic epic, a short mm. epic, not one in lots and lots of books, yeah. just a few hundred lines, one describing perhaps uh, romantic themes rather mm. than military themes, heroic themes. I, and so I on. see, and actually, just to tie that in, he's part of this movement, does he ever explicitly mention any major sort of character players in first century BC politics. He does, he does. Julius Caesar comes in for a lot of stick. Uh, There are a number (laughs) of poems where he's mentioned by name. I do not know if you are a black man or a white man. That's one of them, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's one of them. Pompey possibly also mentioned as well, though poem 29, he's he's not attacked directly, but at the end of that poem, um, Catullus addresses the father-in-law and the son-in-law, and that's clearly a reference to Caesar Mm. and Pompey, who were technically in that relationship (laughs) uh, in the, the period when the the, the poems Mm. were written and what's interesting about these poems is that he really is quite savage about Julius Caesar now that has been interpreted as a kind of partisan attack but I think again the tendency in recent criticism is to see him more as incensed almost by the corruption of political Mm. life in general at his period so there's a sort of contrast there between his romantic ideals his ideals of love and friendship personal ideals on the one Mm. hand and his his attacks on on public figures on the other Mm. Of course, ironically, rather undermined by the fact that his relationship with Lesbia doesn't work out all that well. And indeed, several of his relations with friends seem to go a bit askew as Mm. well. We have a number of poems in which he attacks former friends for Mm. betraying him one way or another. I see. Now, you've spent the last many years with Catullus. You you teach a module, am I right, on on him in, in Trinity? And you also are still 
for the last few years have been writing a commentary, as I said earlier on. What's your favourite Catullus poem? Could you read it first in Latin and then with your translation and tell me a little bit about it? I'm happy to do that. I would say that this poem has been my favourite ever since I first read Catullus mm. rather, as a rather naive 17-year-old. Mm. And I think what appealed to me about it then was just the immediacy, which I hope will come over when I read my, my translation mm. uh, particularly. But there are a number of other things which I've come to find increasingly fascinating mm. about it over the years, so it's really stayed with me. Um, so let me read it first, and then I'll say a little bit about why I find it so fascinating. Mm. This is poem eight, in Latin, first of all. Misa Catullae desinas ineptiera. Equod vides perisse perditum ducas, for sere quandam candiditi be soles, cum ventitabas quopuella ducebat, am mater nobis quanta marbitu nulla. E bila multa cum jocosa fiebant, quae tu olebas, nec puella nolebat, for sere vere candiditi be soles. Nunc la wot non walt, tu quoquim potens noli, nec quae fugit sectare, nec misa vive, sed obstinata mente perfer, obdura. Wale puella, young Catullus obdorat, nec terrequirat, nec rogabit in vitam. Ha tu dolebis cum rogabaris nulla. Skelesta, white, quite tibi manet vita. Quis nunc te adibit, qui videbaris bella. Quem nunc amabis, qui usesse diceris. Quem basiabis, qui la bella modebis. At tu Catulle, destinatus obdora. So here's my translation. Poor Catullus, stop being a jerk. And when you see something's gone, write it off as lost. Once the sun shone bright for you, when you came and went at your girl's beck and call, the girl, loved by me as no other woman ever shall be. Then we had all that fun, which you wanted, and the girl was not unwilling. Yes, truly the sun shone bright for you. Now she is unwilling, so you be unwilling too, since there's nothing you can do about it. Don't chase after a girl who shuns you or live in misery, but be resolute, stand firm and toughen up. Goodbye, girl. Now Catullus is tough and won't seek you out or ask for you if you're reluctant. But you'll be sorry when you're not asked at all. Woe betide you, wretch. What kind of life awaits you? Who will come to you now? To whom will you look beautiful? Whom will you love now? Whose girl will you be called? Whom will you kiss? Whose lips bite? But as for you, Catullus, stick to your resolution and be tough. <laughs> So, as I say, the things that I've come to find increasingly fascinating about this poem over the years. One thing that I think is particularly brilliant about this one is the way that Catullus uses the structure of the poem itself, uses mm. verbal repetition to create a sense of strong emotion, or almost a sense of immediacy. Mm. So, and paradoxically, artifice creates a sense of immediacy. Mm. So the poem is divided quite neatly into two halves with a kind of frame. The frame are the three points in the poem, the mm. beginning, the end, and the middle, where he exhorts himself to, mm. to toughen up, to man up, uh, we might say. But those repeated lines that contain some repetition frame two passages in which he looks back to the past, rather nostalgically, mm. to the time when things were going well, and then forward to the future. And I think the way that the poem is structured creates a sense that although he keeps telling himself to, to toughen up, he's not getting anywhere. He's mm. going round and round in circles, and he's always going to keep mm. sliding back into the past. And the thing I think is particularly brilliant here is in that second part of the poem when he's looking to the future, we have this repeated series of, re series of rhetorical questions, really, in which he repeats the word who, who, whom, whose, quis, qui, quem, quius, good, good uh, revision of your declension of a quiz for those of you who are uh, uh, learning Latin, in which we get a sort of slide. So he starts off obviously trying to sort of mock Lesbia, if the girl is Lesbia, who's going to come to you now? No one's going to want you now is the implication. Mm. But as the series goes on, he seems to sort of slide from scorn to something much more like jealousy. Mm. So, you know, who are you going to love? Who are you going to kiss? Mm. Whose lips are you going to bite? And that series of question words sort of mm. really effectively conveys that slide, I think. Mm. So that's one thing I think is wonderful about it. Another thing that I find particularly interesting about this poem, again, is the way it plays on gender roles, the, the mm. kind of inversion of gender roles that we were talking about earlier. So Catullus talks about being at her beck and call. The Latin word is wentitabas. He not just came and went where she led, but kept on doing it. Went his mm. is what's called a frequentative form, mm. implying something that he did over and over again. So she's the boss, he's just mm. following. She decides it's over. All he can do is, you know, reconcile himself mm. to it. And in the face of that, then, he's trying to man up. He's trying to be tough the way a man ought to be, but it's not working. It's not coming mm. off. And then the third thing, again, which I think is particularly fascinating about this poem, is the use of comic models, which, again, mm. I talked about briefly earlier. 
in that a number of scholars have pointed out that the sorts of things Catullus says here are very strongly reminiscent of the sorts of uh, speeches that we find in the mouths of that comic young mm. man. So the young man's trying to make up his mind to, to do what his dad wants mm. and, and break up with the prostitute. And he's so kind of hopeless and dithering mm. that he can't bring himself to do mm. it. So that again, we're, we're left with a question here. I mean, do we laugh at Catullus? Do we think he's being ridiculous? Or do we see him more provocatively as saying, well, look, you know, here's the comic young man, but perhaps we could take that kind of role seriously. Mm. Which again, you know, it's quite, quite a provocative thing to say, I think, in mm. the context of, of first century Rome. Yeah. Now, moving on to his later life, you said mm. earlier, obviously we don't know that much about him. Do we know anything about his later life and his death? The short answer is no. Uh, we're told in a work called The Chronicle uh, of St Jerome that he died at the age of 30 in 57 BC. Mm. And that's an idea that traditionally, again, scholars have picked up and run with. I think partly because it suits our idea of you know, the romantic young man sort of <laughs> dying of love or dying of, of I don't know, poetic, <laughs> poetic passion uh, at a young age. I mean, an old Catullus is an idea that maybe yeah. doesn't really appeal to us. But in fact, what Jerome says there can't be right, because we know from references in his poetry that he was still alive in, in 55, 54. So if he yeah. died at the age of 30 and was born in 87, he can't have died. Yeah. He can't, either he didn't die at the age of, of 30 or he wasn't born in, in 87. 87. I mean. Okay. So, I mean, it could be that Jerome's right. He could be that he died young, but maybe his whole yeah. entry for Catullus is simply and confused. We, we, and we, have, we just don't know. We, we have, have no other evidence. We have no idea of no. what he died of or what... No. what what happens? No way of knowing. Um, it's all speculation. And do we know how his relationship with Lesby ended? It just they they never sort of ran off and got married as he seems to would have liked, or there wasn't the again. <laughs> it's it's kind of hard to pin down in that there are a number of poems in the collection which seem to be the the farewell poem. Mm. Seventy six is a good candidate. Eleven is a good candidate. And again, modern criticism has tended to see this as. You know, one of the really interesting things about the collection that it doesn't tell a straightforward narrative, that it Mm. gives us little snapshots, and it's kind of up to us what order we put them in. So, uh, again, the only evidence is internal and how what we make of that internal Mm. evidence, how we turn these separate little incidents into a story, is sort of up to each individual reader. Mm. Now, to sum everything all up and bring it together, what are the three most important things you'd like people to remember about Catullus and his poetry? OK, well, I suppose the first thing is just that this is really wonderful poetry. It's, it's particularly, I think, wonderful in the sense that it's very accessible, it's very easy to read, even if you know nothing about the ancient mm. world, but it really repays further study as well. The more you study it, the more you find mm. in it, I think. And I've been living with Catullus <laughs> for a very long time now, so I can, I can say that quite honestly. The second point I'd like people to remember is that this is not just love poetry. Catullus is best known as a love poet, but some of the other poems, the invectives, the attack poems, are just as worth reading. Some of them are mm. very funny, very <laughs> scurrilous, but very funny. Some of them have very interesting things to tell us about Roman ideas and patterns of thought. Uh, and then the third thing I suppose that I'd like to, people to to remember about Catullus is that he has this very interesting take on gender roles, on the idea of what it is to be a man, what it is to have a romantic relationship with a woman mm. in first century Rome. Which I think can be, again, something that has very strong resonances in the modern world, mm. in the sense that, you know, although we like to think of ourselves as very enlightened and so on, in some ways our society is still quite patriarchal, Mm. a a distinct lack of women, for example, as CEOs of companies, Mm. as professors, women Mm. are are in the minority still. Mm. And I think that's something that that suggests is the difficulty of moving away from traditional ideology, Mm. that that ideas which have been with us for such a long time can't just be Mm. chucked out like that. And I think we can see something similar going on in Catullus. He wants this relationship, sort of a relationship of equality perhaps, with Lesbia. But it doesn't work out. And when it doesn't work out, he reverts to something much more sort of traditional than his uh, uh, way of, of reacting. Mm, I see. Well, that brings us nicely to the end of the podcast. Professor Gale, thank you so much for joining me today. Really enjoyed it. If you enjoyed today's podcast and want to find out more or get involved with Classical Youth Society of Ireland, you can contact us via our social media pages on www.facebook.com forward slash Classical Youth Society Ireland our Twitter at CYSI underscore, or for any direct inquiries, you can email us cysiofficial at gmail.com. Today's podcast was edited by Michael Fuller. I hope you enjoyed it, and I will catch you next time. <laughs>